Welcome, Wargamers, to the Celestial Motes of Arcane Power, because today we are talking about the Seraphon. They just got a new book, and I am excited to jump into it. Uh, there's some new lore here, and I want to explore it all. This is one of the coolest factions, just for the sake that we've seen it evolve so stinking much. If you don't know, Seraphon was, I believe, the first battle tome to come out for Old World armies into Age of Sigmar. So they are like OG. And every single time they have a book drop, it pivots them in a new and exciting direction. Now, I will say, if you are interested in this army or playing Seraphon or anything, if you wouldn't mind, please consider using the affiliate link in my description below for Not Just Gaming, an awesome store here in the US on the East Coast with 15% off GW products. And that link goes a long way to supporting me, my wife, this channel. It's life-changing stuff and it means the world to me. Even if you're just shopping for a few paints or hobby supplies, please go check them out. And so let's begin our conversation with a very basic question. Who are the Seraphon? I'm kind of intermittently redoing these series, so uh, let's break this down for new folks very succinctly. These are the lizard men of the Age of Sigmar setting. They have a lot of Aztec and uh, Mesoamerican themes, like in terms of like their iconography, architecture, and so on. And in world, they are part of the forces of order, but also completely alien to them. We covered this idea of the alien, of like not knowing who your allies really are, when we talked about the Sylvaneth, but these guys take it to a different level. Even in the very like core context, they can't speak to other races. At least Sylvaneth can try to communicate their ideas. Seraphon have literally no communication options other than Psychic, which we do see from time to time. My point is, they're very different for being a force of order. And as I mentioned before, the story of the Seraphon in Age of Sigmar has evolved immensely over time, right? From painfully vague to now exceptionally compelling. And so for a brief recap, here we go. Long ago in the Old World, a species known only as the Old Ones foresaw the coming of chaos, and they engineered a massively powerful species to be their servants and warriors that we knew as the lizard. And their job was to have this great big plan called the capital G, capital P, great plan. That was to contain and or eliminate chaos from this realm, like plane of reality kind of thing. And so they created the lizard men, all their little genus and subspecies and all these things and just kind of set them to their task. Now this is ancient history in the old world, which actually means that the birth of the species that would one day become the Seraphon predates the existence of just about every other deity in the Pantheon of Order. It predates Sigmar, the elven gods, Nagash, etc. So they've been around and they're using arcane reservoirs and astral power and geomantic energies and so on to again, fulfill their mission of deterring chaos. And it was intended to take millennia. That's why they created an entire species rather than, you know, a, a single item or MacGuffin that to do the job. But as you might have figured out, they ultimately failed in the old world. The other species of that planet, particularly humans, rose and unleashed chaos into the world, specifically RK on the Evershow. The planet was lost, the great plan seemingly, at least on that planet, failed, and the lizard men boarded their temple ships and flew away. Which I never knew was an option. Like when that happened as I was reading the book, I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know they could always do that. Okay, cool. Now, like many holdovers from the old world, there's a lot of myths and legends surrounding the next part of their story. Because two questions immediately come to mind. How did they get to the mortal realms? And what is their relation to Dracothian? Because that those are probably the two most uh, glaring questions people want to know what's his relation to Dracothian because they are seem to be uh, at least it's undeniable there's some relationship there but also how'd they get here? and this battle tome at least the current one we have now does my absolute favorite thing that Games Workshop does if you're listening please keep doing this um, instead of giving you the answer to your question they give you theories and then you know they're always like given some gravitas like the scholars of Hish think that blah blah, blah meaning the most enlightened and smart people think blank, but also there's evidence to the contrary. So one popular theory is that the god of dragons, Dracothian, found these great temple ships of the lizard men and saw them as some kind of kindred spirit and brought them over to the realms. Which honestly pans out because that is exactly Sigmar's origin story in the mortal realms too. I don't know what Dracothian's doing just out there like hunting for garbage that's floating past, but whatever. But after giving this theory, the book, or the battle tome rather, itself expresses the limits of this story. Meaning it makes more questions. Was there a connection? Like was Dracothian made by the old ones? 
he's not an old one, otherwise the Seraphon would react differently. So is he a product of them? The Seraphon who arrived here, were they in some sort of stasis? Did they all die? Save the Slon? We don't get a whole lot of answers to that theory. What everybody agrees upon, however, is Dracothian and them are, are buddies, fist bumping all the time. And it seems like he brought them to these realms specifically to Azir. Now when this happens, this is the event that changes the lizard men of the old world into the Seraphon as we know them. Whatever this created species is that is the collective lizardmen is exceptionally malleable. By that I mean if they spend a ton of time anywhere, their physical form begins to reflect it, almost like aggressive adaptations. When, presumably, Dracothian left them in the skies of Azir, they became beings of starlight, ether magic given physical form, literally the heavens made manifest. And this is how all Seraphon were when they were first introduced to the mortal realms lore-wise, but it's also, funny enough, how you and I were introduced to them battle tome wise in the first battle tome there was no starborn coalesced we'll get to that in a second there was only these magical like light lizards that come from the heavens and that's because they were dropped off there now the seraphon who choose to remain in his ear or like you know use it as their home base kind of going to and fro they are known as the starborn they are highly mobile because they can go between realms at their own whim and even on a battlefield they're incredible because the power of azir allows their slon star masters to deploy entire armies with nothing more than a thought like they become light it's almost as if the slon is casting his imagination or memories out and the army just takes shape and this is incredibly cool but it also means that these armies are heavily reliant on their slon to keep like the memories and the thoughts pristine. If anything happens to the Slon, even if it's not combat related, it could devastate the entire faction. You know, if his mind degrades or his ability to cast magic, it's all downhill. And this is really what we knew Seraphon as for the longest time. It's just, you know, when they would get a cut, starlight would pour out of them. They were the bane of chaos, almost a creative species to hunt chaos. And I loved it. But as our time in the mortal realms drew on, we started to see kind of a new development. You see, I mentioned the Seraphon were malleable. When they would settle into a specific location amongst the realms, meaning out of the skies, the heavens, they began to lose that etheric quality. They started to slowly become flesh and blood and subtly change to match the magics of the realms, just like everybody else. So uh, when they land, they become corporeal and take on aspects of every mortal realm, just like if you're human. And actually, the realm of fire, you get more aggressive and like physical if you're in hish you become more peaceful and enlightened and so on these seraphon who are much more i guess substantial in their form are known as the coalesced and this is a really big divide in the history of the species because they are definitely without question related to one another but the moment some of you are corporeal and not that's weird because now at this point you have different hopes dreams and aspirations the corporeal ones the, the coalesced are worried about attrition numbers which is a thing because everyone's starlight. Likewise, we have coalesced armies where the Saurus and maybe even some of the higher level skinks can take some of the burden of leadership and magic away from the Slon, which the Starborn won't do, and so on. Like what I'm basically getting at is there's pluses and minuses to either, but it is a big divide. Now, in addition to the substrands, I'm gonna call them of Seraphon, we also gained a little bit more insight into their creation. You see, spawning pools went away for the longest time in Age of Six, and these were an absolute staple of the old world lizard men. Think of it as a giant pool of water, although now it's kind of like has this ethereal quality to it, but it's essentially a square pool of water, and it's just filled with like like weird primordial soup stuff at the bottom. Now and then, a spawning will occur and Seraphon will simply march out of this pool. Like it's the coolest thing. It's like it's producing them on a cellular level under the water and then they just walk right out. Fully formed constructs ready to serve their salon. And now in Age of Sigmar, these are described more like pools of magic water and so on, but we know how they're made and that's just so stinking fun. And there's a lot of ambiguity regarding spawning pools. So like if you're not into that concept, you are not bound to. And so with kind of the, the loose information out there, Let's step back and talk about the army as a whole, because it really does seem from the ground up that every single unit is designed, which is their theme, to contribute to a singular big plan. And so when you're talking about them as an army, at the top, meaning the fewest of them, are the Slon. These are the frogmen in their floating chairs, exceptionally powerful psychics, able to go toe to toe in some cases with deity level characters, especially if they work together. In Starborn, 
they might be the only living character on their temple ship. In the Coalesced, he's the most highly guarded heart and mind of the Seraphon. Either way, the Slon, you know, I like to use the Slon as like a proxy for me on the table in that like this is the seminal hero. Everything revolves around them. It's a cool piece to have on the table. Beyond that, really the, they start to split in two different kind of subspecies. The two big ones are skinks and sword. Skinks are these small skirmishers or scouts, infiltrators, very limited intelligence, much more run by instinct, but it makes them wildly independent so long as they understand what they're trying to do, and they make up the overwhelming numbers of the Seraphon arm. Hordes of skinks. Next up are the saurus, which are sort of like the average troop slash brute muscle. Uh, Basically imagine a gator standing up and taking a weapon. There are some elite variants, whatever, but Saurus is like the basic model. And then there's just different offshoots of them. Next up from Saurus are the Croxagores. These are the bigger, thicker boys. Uh, not really like line troops. These are more like big old brutes, all killy, no thinky, just moving forward and, and basically trying to be like living weapons. And then I put a last section here. I just put fauna and it's just, they use so many different kinds of animals and creatures in their army. So like this is where you get Saurus riding giant T-Rexes. You got models that look like Triceratops and Stegodons and all kinds of crazy looking things. And that's just the beasts that they use for both as a piece of burden to carry weapons and how it is and that kind of stuff, but also as cavalry. And so I think that's a pretty dang good introduction to Seraphon as a concept. So let's pause here and just ask, why is this cool, right? If you're like, why would I wanna learn more about these dudes? What I love about this army, are, it's a few things. You can have anything that you want and it will make sense. All temple ships will have all things because it's literally limited by the Slon's imagination, i.e. yours. No matter what kind of sub faction you want to choose, no matter Coalesced or Starborn, the models you have in your collection will work and it's cool. And it's been great to see this army change over time, right? Just the Starborn initially, and then we had the big divide of Starborn and Coalesced, and then we got spawning pools just kind of alluded to. It's just every time this book comes out, it's an absolute banger. And while I want to talk about the Great Plan, I'm going to do a dedicated video to it because even though the Great Plan failed on the old world, uh, there's still aspects of it that are trying to run with the limited capacity they can in the mortal realm. So it's not the end of their story, it's just the continuation of it, which makes them very interesting. But that being said, I have a lot of questions about these guys that this book didn't really answer for me. So for example, why is Azir the only realm that they can infuse with in the heaven. So like they go to the sky of Azir and they become beings of pure light. But why can't they like stay in Akshi and then bleed fire instead of starlight? You know, like the malleability doesn't seem consistent. And I would just love to know more about why. It might be that the old ones simply designed them that way, that Azir energy was fundamental to them because it makes them better at fighting chaos. I can see that. And this is an area where the, the model support for the faction, I think, does a great service to what they're trying to articulate in the story. By that I mean, if you look at the army of the Seraphon, it looks clearly well designed. There's Skinks, Source, Slon, and a myriad of creatures all out there to facilitate specific tasks, but every character is made for a purpose. They're all intentional, and I think that makes them so much fun. It makes them compelling. There's no way a wrong way to collect them. You can do whatever you like. I just... They're a great time. I would love to hear your thoughts on the new Seraphon. I've been like devouring all different kinds of coverage from, you know, Warhammer Weekly, that kind of stuff, uh, other podcasts, just trying to learn as much as I can. It seems like it has dang near infinite potential depending on how you want to play them between the rules options and the, just the sheer bulk of the model line. I am here for it. So let me know your thoughts, how you feel about the Seraphon in the comments down below. I will respond to you there. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I can't wait to chat with you next time. Happy Wargaming.